نحمد ونسلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد عن أبي سعيد الخضر رضي الله عنه قال خرج رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في أضحى في أضحى أو فطر إلى المصلى فمر على النساء فقال يا معشر النساء تصدقنا فإني أريتكن أكثر أهل النار فقلنا وبما يا رسول الله قال تكثرن اللعنة وتك وتكفر وتكفرن العشير ما رأيت من ناقصات عقل ودين أذهب للب الرجل الحازم من إحدى كنا قلنا ما نقصان ما نقصان ديننا وعقلنا يا رسول الله قال أليس شهادة المرأة مثل نصف شهادة الرجل قال بل قلنا بلى قال فذلك من نقصان من نقصان عقلها قال ليس إذا خاضت لم تصلي ولم تصوم قلنا بلى قال فذلك من نقصان دينهن متفق عليه Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu anhu says that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Salat al-Adha or Salat al-Fitr as he was going to lead the people in prayer he passed by a group of women and he said O oh my ladies give a lot in charity because I have seen majority of you in Jahannam. They asked, why? Oh, yeah. oh Rasulullah said, because you curse a lot and you don't, you're not very thankful. And then he said, I've not seen a person who is considered a lesser of an intellect, yet you can twist the mind of a very intelligent person around your finger. So they asked, why do you say that we have a, def uh, a defect when it comes to our intellect and we also have a defect when it comes to our religious affairs. And he asked, is in the testification of two of you equal to that of one of a man? They said, yeah. He said, that is why you are considered less when it comes to intellect. And he said, when you are in your periods, don't you miss out on Salah and Saum? They said, yes. So that is another sign of the defect you have when it comes to religious affairs. This hadith made me ponder and a lot of issues are concerned in this hadith. First and foremost, Alhamdulillah, we are just round the corner when it comes to Ramadan. Sad to say, Again, we'll have the same situation. This one fasting a day before, this one fasting a day after. This one doing Eid on this day, this one doing Eid on that day. Each one has got evidence to back up his claim. But I would like to advise especially my elders. As the Quran says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people who are knowledgeable in that field when you know not. When it comes to matters of the moon, Ilm al-Sharia is not enough. Ilm al-Sharia backs up with the Hadith and Quran. But the people we need here are those who are involved in astronomical science or geography. Just to give you a slight idea of what I am talking about. I've been very passionate about the moon sighting since childhood. With my late dad, I used to sit at Jamia with the then Chief Qadi, Sheikh Hamad Qasim. And I thank God they used to do a lot of research. I'm sorry to say this, that from time to time there are differences. 
But our elders knew how to address these differences. Today, we have made it an issue. The father is fasting, the son is doing Eid. The brother is fasting, the sister is doing Eid. There's no problem with that. But looking at the other one with down, cast eyes, or demeaning the other one because he is not following what you have followed, that is wrong. It is Eid. It is Ramadan. It does not interfere with your religion. But let us understand when it comes to geography and astronomy, those are the people to be consulted, not the ulama only. The ulama should have a backing up. We can build masjids of $4 million, $5 million. Yet a telescope that can sight the moon costs only $50,000. $50,000 is a very minimal amount. If we invested in that technology and trained our youth how to use it. And mashallah, we have got technology all over. Let's look for the highest point in our cities and set up the telescope there and let all those who are trustees of the masjid have access to it. That's one way of solving our issues. Mostly, we usually follow the naked eye or we follow other countries. We either follow the Arabs or the Indians. This one belittles us. Does it mean we as Africans are not men enough to sight our own moon? As much as we would like to do Eid all over at once. But let us use the proper ways. First and foremost, a lot of the shiyukh, I have asked them about where the moon rises and sets. They think it's east and west. No. The moon does not rise in the east or set in the west or vice versa. The moon rises in the southwest and sets in the northeast. That's why you find most of the, of the time, the people of northeastern areas sight the moon a day ahead or faster than those at the coast. Then they say, oh, that is the moon of the Somalis, that is the moon of the, of the Swahilis. No, it is a matter of using your intellect because it sets in the west, uh, in the northeast. The northeastern areas are more highly likely to sight the moon than any other part of the country. You should take this into consideration, first and foremost. That northeast, the chances of sighting the moon are higher. At the coast, they go and look for the moon in the sea, in the ocean with the naked eye. In Nairobi or in the cities, it is almost impossible to sight with the moon on the first day. Why? Because of our high-rise buildings and us being farther from the southwest or the northeast. So first and foremost, we should sit down and appreciate that if it is sighted in the northeast or in the southwest, it is okay. Another intellect which my elders have taught me is sighting the moon after Fajr. Most people don't know this. When you sight the moon after Fajr, the day you missed it, it goes missing for two days. The third day will be the first. So if you miss it on the 27th of Ramadan, of the, of the, of the month of Sha'ban, or whichever month it is, then that month most likely will be 29 days. If you miss it on the 28th after Fajr, then definitely that month of 30 days. We don't use these things because we have never sat down with our elders. We think we are .com and we know everything. There are a lot of things our elders know just because they did not write it down. That's why people think that they are not intellect or they are not educated. So one of the things follow up every day after Fajr, especially from the 25th of every month. If you cite it on the 27th morning, then remember that day, month will be 30. If you miss it on the 27th morning, <clears throat> that month will be 29. The other thing is, we can also cite Jupiter 
with our naked eye. And Jupiter and the moon, because most of us are laymen, we cannot differentiate. So sometimes sighting the Jupiter, we feel that is the moon. So sometimes you go wrong on that. So let us invest in technology first and foremost. And let us not rely solely on the fatwa of the ulama, be it the chief qadi or the qadi or so forth. Because scholarly ilm is not enough. The same when it comes to Islamic finance. Islamic finance cannot be solely understood by a sheikh who has just done sharia. Unless he has done mu'amalat or he has done a degree in Islamic banking. It is not easy to understand that finance. The same when it comes to the moon. If a alim has not invested his time in geography or astronomy, then the photos are not enough. Because the photos are on both sides. The Quran says, Man shahida minkum shahra fal yasum. Whoever sights a moon should fast. It does not give the quyud or the limit of makan. But then now the situation comes up. Which country do you follow? Most people like to follow Hijaz, Haram. But Haram, Ibn Uthaymin rahimahullah has clearly written in his fatawa. When the diplomats of Saudi wrote to him and said, what do we do when we're in a country whereby the fasting and the, break, uh, the Eid is different from our country? So people are usually patriotic. Because of that, they asked the question to Ibn Uthayn rahimahullah. And he wrote it in his fatawa. Sight and fast and break the fast with your destiny, your country of residence, not Saudi. And the Saudi ulama have given fatwa several times, don't follow us. But other than that, the Quran says, Fal yasum in any, any place. The moon does not rise in Saudi. It starts in Polynesia. If you tell the ulama of Saudi that we have sighted the moon in Kenya because we are far ahead in sighting the moon than them. Them in sighting the sun, they are on the east side. We are on the west side. We can sight the moon before them. If we give them that information, they'll say, Lasna mas'ulan ankum. They say, we are not responsible for your sighting. The only thing that confuses, especially us Kenyans, is because we are on the same parallel with Saudi when it comes to time. I've done this extensive research. The difference in time between us and Saudi is four minutes. Between us and Haram, four minutes. And today we have got technology. You can open the Haram channel and check the time there and check the time here. Only four minutes. It's because we are on the same longitude. When it comes to longitude, longitude is measured because of the sun rising timings, not because of the moon. When it comes to the moon, we are supposed to follow the latitude, which we are on zero degrees equator. Saudi is 20 degrees east. So when it comes to latitude, the moon follows the latitude. We also know that the tidings, the waves follow the latitude. So it should differentiate between longitudinal and latitude perimeters. When it comes to our uh, timings, these are man-made. Remember the watch was brought in by man. Our difference is four minutes because of the calculations of the geographians who have put us on the same perimeter with Saudi. But in actual fact, if you go to Saudi, the sunrise and sunset times are different from us because they have got some longer days and some longer nights. Unlike, unlike us here in the equator, we have got equal day and equal night. So even there, we are wrong. But because we follow what is man-made, it is okay. But when it comes to the moon, it is latitude. Let us invest extensively in this technology so that when we make a mistake out of human error, it is okay. Secondly, a lot of people have called for the establishment of a mufti's, uh, chief, uh, chief mufti office, grand mufti. I am not, I am okay with it, but Ask yourself, who will choose this mufti? Majlis ulama, Jamia, Subkim, Namnef, Council of Imams. Who will choose it? We will close one door, fitna, and open up seven. Because we have a problem that the chief qadi is chosen by the government. 
So we want to choose our own. But who will choose him? Who will belt the bell round the cat's neck? We will start having problems. We are not yet prepared for that. Our time will come, inshallah, when we are mature enough to do that. But right now we are not prepared for the office of the Grand Mufti. And the Grand Mufti, what will be his duties and obligation? Will they interfere with the office of the Qadi? Are we trying to open up a door of fitna? We should not <coughs> open up a door of fitna. Instead, we should try and resolve. Alhamdulillah, during the days of Sheikh Hamad Qasim, there was a mutual agreement that when it comes to fitr, we will follow the local sightings. When it comes to adha, we will follow the global sightings. Both the ulama are right. The only difference is some ulama say we should follow the local sightings of the area. Others say we can follow the global sightings. That's the only difference. But I'm sad to say that you know the media and you know the kuffar. They make it an issue. They don't make the same issue when it comes to Christians who have the seventh day on Sabbath, Saturday, and the others on Sunday. Yet it's never an issue. They all worship on different days every week. Yet the media does not highlight it. But for the Muslims, they highlight it. And I've been at the center of that controversy. Why? Because most of the times, when there's a second Eid, I'm the one who's called upon to lead the prayers. And my elders ask me, Muhammad, why do you do that? I said, Sheikh, if I don't do it, someone else will do it and he will open up a door of fitna. And there's nothing that says that I cannot pray Eid twice. There's nothing that prevents me from praying Eid twice. It's a sunnah. It has nothing to do with fara'id. But I'm sorry to say, shaitan works day and night to make sure that there's disintegration in the Muslim ummah. We are the only ummah today who are united without a leader. We are orphans, but we are still united when it comes to issue. If you go to Saudi, they're praying the same salah we're praying in Kenya. If you go to America, they're praying the same salah. The other issue usually comes up when it comes to Arafah. To the extent that even some politicians started giving their right on it. Said, Arafah is one. Yes, Arafah is one, my dear. Salat al Dhuhr is one. But why do we pray at a different time from America? Arafah is a makan. Arafah has that nasab or tansib of At-Tasi'a Yawm Al-Arafah. At-Tasi'a Yawm Al-Hajj is also referred to as Yawm Al-Arafah. Even during the Jahiliyyah, it was still there. But the same thing is that <clears throat> when it comes to Salah, it has the same name, same action, but when it comes to a different destination, you pray it at a different time. So the only difference is whether you want to follow global sighting or you want to follow local sighting. Kullukum al khair. But let's not make it an issue such that it becomes a bone of contention. It should not be a bone of contention. We should try and find a solution through the ulama. But remember every alim has become a mujtahid. And you cannot convince a mujtahid to follow the ra'i of another mujtahid. You cannot con convince Imam Shafi to follow Imam Abu Hanifa. Kullu ma'al khair. But everyone respects the other. What we should try and appreciate is respecting each other's opinion.